Before undertaking anything, it was well to make trial of the arms of the god. Slender chainlets stretched from his fingers up to his shoulders and fell behind, where men, by pulling them, made the two hands rise to a level with the elbows and come close together against the belly. They were moved several times in succession with little abrupt jerks. Then the instruments were still. The fire roared. People flung into the flames pearls, gold vases, cups, torches, all their wealth. The offerings became constantly more numerous and more splendid. At last, a man who tottered, a man pale and hideous with terror, thrust forward a child. Then a little black mass was seen between the hands of the Colossus and sank into the dark opening. The priests bent over the edge of the great flagstone, and a new song burst forth, celebrating the joys of death and of new birth into eternity. The children ascended slowly, and as the smoke formed lofty eddies as it escaped, they seemed, at a distance, to disappear in a cloud. The brazen arms were working quickly now. Nevertheless, the appetite of the god was not appeased. He ever wished for more. In order to furnish him with a larger supply, the victims were piled up on his hands with a big chain above them which kept them in their place. It was impossible to distinguish them in the giddy motion of the horrible arms. This lasted for a long, indefinite time, until the evening. Then the partitions inside assumed a darker glow, and burning flesh could be seen. Some even believed that they could descry hair, limbs, and whole bodies. You, So, Tom, that is by Gustave Flaubert, the author of Madame Bovary. Uh, and it's a very different book. It's his book Salon Beau, which was published in 1862. Very much not set in provincial France. Absolutely not. Uh, no, not the story of uh, of, a, of a young woman who's been reading too much in uh, French romantic periodicals. This is very different. This is set in Carthage. And I remember reading this um, when I was at university and being stunned that it was so different from Madame Bovary because what Salon Beau does is it plunges you into this incredibly violent, lurid, orientalist fantasy of ancient Carthage, doesn't it? It does. And this is um, set against a, a very particular episode. And it's not one of the most famous episodes in Carthaginian history. It's um, It directly follows on from the first great war that the Carthaginians fought against the Romans, the, the first Punic War, as yeah. it's called. And the Carthaginians have been defeated and they've had to pay... Um, reparations to the Romans. And as a result, they can't pay their mercenaries, which they've been employing to conduct the war. And yeah. so the mercenaries have turned on Carthage and put it under siege. And it looks like the city may be about to be captured. Yeah. And the great Carthaginian general, the commander who had remained undefeated in the war against the Romans, Hamilcar Barca, has been summoned to join the rest of the Carthaginian elite to pay the ultimate sacrifice, which is to give their firstborn to the great god Moloch. So it, yes. it, it is the god Moloch whose hands have yeah. been moving up and down with the great it, golden it, it, chain. It's very Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom, isn't it? I mean, it's the, scene, the sacrifice scene in the Temple of Doom. Yes, it is. Uh, and that, of course, I guess would be playing on exactly this scene. Um, and Hamilcar's son, a little boy called Hannibal, and Hamilcar does not want to sacrifice his his son. Um, and so he has got a slave boy instead and, and swapped them. And of course, this means that Hamilcar's son, Hannibal, survives. And yes. Hannibal will go on to grow up and become the most famous of all Carthaginians, um, the man who leads elephants over the Alps, yep. brings Rome almost to its knees, um, one of the, you know, and, and the story of Hannibal's war against the Romans is, is one of the great, great, probably the most famous war actually in the whole of ancient history. But um, we are not going to be focusing on Hannibal's war, but on the early history of Carthage in this series. So, Tom, um, that, that war that you described with the mercenaries, that's 238 BC. Yeah. Um, so we'll be getting sort of towards that, but just on the, the Orientalism and whatnot of Carthage. So 
even people who know nothing about ancient history will have heard the name, won't they? I mean, there are Carthages in, in the United States, for example, named after the city. And I guess the reputation of Carthage, even among people who don't know much about it, is that you know Rome is um, disciplined, formidable, clean-shaven, mm-hmm. um, all of that stuff. And Carthage is, I mean, it is it is that sort Exotic. of... Exotic. Exactly. Cruel. It, right. Luxurious, Luxuri- decadent. Yes. Yeah. Unbelievably, as you said, unbelievably cruel. Child sacrifice is obviously a massive element of that. These incredibly yeah. weird and terrifying gods, but also rich and entrepreneurial. Yeah. So the, the French, when they had, after the French Revolution, when they thought that they were the Romans, they used to say that the British were the Carthaginians because all we yes. cared about was making money. But also because uh, Carthage was a great maritime power, and yes. of course Rome is a, is a great land power, and so their war was often characterised as you know the war between the elephant and the whale, that kind yes. of thing. And so the French were very keen to 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 brand the um, the British as Carthaginian, both because they were seen as being treacherous, mercantilist, but also of course because ultimately Carthage loses and mm. gets obliterated, but is commemorated by the Romans as her greatest enemy. And Hannibal is, you know, seen as as the most formidable opponent that the Romans ever fought. Uh, and so that's a crucial part of why the memory of Carthage endures. And so we want to um well we'll be we'll be covering the first of those great wars in in the fourth of our of our episodes. But before that, we, we want to look at what the origins are of, of Carthage, um, what's the characteristics of her, her civilization. Um, did they really sacrifice their children or is that just kind of Roman propaganda? Yeah. Um, to try and kind of bring back to life this extraordinary civilization which has has been um but I think kind of blackened so repeatedly over the course of history. And Tom, just for people who don't know, so Carthage is present day. It's it's effectively the, on the site of present day Tunis, the capital yeah. of Tunisia in North Africa. And almost all the traces, I don't know. I mean, if you've ever been to Tunis, I've been to Tunis. I actually thought it was a bit disappointing because mm. all the almost every single trace of ancient Carthage, apart from a, your little bit of stone, well, um, has been erased. Well, uh, we might come to that in a it, in a minute. I mean, just 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 to talk about um, this isn't the first episode that we've done on Carthage. So in the World Cup, we did one. Tunisia were playing in the World Cup, and so our episode was on the founding of Carthage, which which is a kind of famous legend because it was enshrined by Virgil in the Aeneid, and it described how Aeneas, who is a, a prince fleeing Troy, who is fated by the gods to go to Italy and there father the line of kings that will culminate in the founding of Rome. But he stops off in what is now Tunisia, and he sees there the founding of a city by a woman from a a, a city called Tyre. And this woman is called Dido, but she's also known as Elissa. Um, And she has come from um, what is now uh, Lebanon. Um, right. So uh, in ancient times, it was called Canaan. So she is a Tyrian princess. Um, and the story goes, uh, and this is a story that doesn't feature in Virgil's account, but was kind of repeatedly told by Greek and Roman historians, that um, she had been married to her uncle, a guy called Akerbas, and um, Dido's sister, and Dido's brother, a man called Pygmalion, was the king of Tyre, was very, very jealous of Acerbus because Acerbus was so rich. And so he has Acerbus murdered. Um, and he then wants to seize Acerbus's wealth. But before he can do that, Dido makes an offering of it um, to the gods by throwing it, putting it all, all the gold into sacks and throwing it into the sea. But in fact, Dominic, the, sa- the sacks are full of sand not gold. And she has taken the gold and she sails off, heads west to found Carthage. And this is clearly a myth. I mean, you know, this is, it has a myth all over it. But what's intriguing is that um, there are echoes of authentic uh, Tyrian names in the classical names. So, um, so Pygmalion, Pumayaton, uh, Elissa, Dido, Elishat, and Akerbas, uh, Zakabal. And the, so they, 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 these names do seem to come from genuinely Tyrian sources. And the other thing, of course, that um, that thing of throwing gold away, of, of, of making it as an offering to the gods, I mean, that is kind of echoed in a little bit in Salambo. Um, before they start sacrificing the children, they are hurling in their jewels and their, 
their yeah. necklaces and their gold to the flames. So perhaps there's kind of elements there. And one thing that is absolutely certain is that Carthage really was founded by fr- fr- by colonists from Tyre. From so, Lebanon, yeah. F- f- yes, yeah, so, so the city in, in Lebanon. And we know this from a very famous detail that is recorded by Herodotus. When the, so, so Tyre ends up being conquered by the Persian kings. And the son of Cyrus the Great, the first and, uh, and most formidable of all the Persian kings, a guy called Cambyses, he conquers Egypt. And then he wants to press on westwards and conquer Carthage. And to do that, he needs the assistance of a, a Tyrian fleet because Tyre is a great, a great city of sailors. Um, and the Tyrians refuse to participate Um, on the basis that the Carthaginians are their children and that the the Carthaginians still come to to Tyre to make offerings. And in fact, Dominic, you'll remember um, that Alexander the Great goes on to besiege Tyre and to capture it. And the story goes that when he captures Tyre, there is a contingent of Carthaginian ambassadors there who've come to make offerings to Tyre. So... um, a special you know, and relationship, Tom, a special between relationship. Carthage and Tyre. So, so, so we know that from the from the Greek sources, but we also know it from uh, from Carthaginian sources. So, actually, um, things have survived from Carthage. Not everything was was destroyed. So, there are quite a lot of of inscriptions, and on these inscriptions, you will read references to sons of Tyre, to the Carthaginians right. as sons of Tyre. So. Um, it, it seems that to be able to, I suppose, a bit like saying that your ancestors came over with the Mayflower, yeah. that to be able to claim a Tyrian heritage, even you know in the second century BC, is a, a real marker of yeah, status. That would, make, that would make sense. I think t- that to know about Carthage, we first of all need to know about Tyre. And sure. so that is going to be the subject of today's episode. So Tyre is simultaneously fabulously ancient and a parvenu. So it's... Uh, the earliest reference to it is is um, the 19th century BC. So that's almost kind of 4,000 years ago. But relative to other cities uh, on the coast of what's now Lebanon, um, it's actually quite a parvenu. So we have uh, Byblos, um, which is the, the city that gives its name to the, the Greek word for book and, and ultimately to, to the Bible. To the Bible. Yeah. Uh, and Sidon, which is its near neighbor, a rival. Yeah. Um, and uh, these are much older than Tyre, but Tyre, when it starts to emerge on the scene in the, the second millennium BC, it has a lot of advantages going for it. And so it very rapidly comes to take over uh, the older cities. So um, the reason for this is that it has a lot of natural advantages. It has, um, it's situated on an island about what kind of um, half a mile off, off the shore. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, it's got a rock which can serve it as a fortress. It's got fresh water, so it's got springs, so it can you know it, does, it can be supplied and withstand a siege. Uh, it's got two great natural harbors, um, which are considerably enhanced over the course of its history, and it has quite a fertile hinterland. So um, the soil of, of mainland Lebanon is 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 very fertile. But the problem is that it, it can't expand to become a great empire in the way that, say, Egypt had or Assyria or Babylon will, because um, its expansion eastwards is blocked by the great range of Mount Lebanon. And this yeah, is true of narrow, all the cities. Yeah, it's quite so a it's narrow, quite narrow yeah, um, stretch, isn't it, where you can sort of farm and stuff and then you get to the mountains. Yeah. And, and because of this, um, they periodically come under the, under the kind of the influence of the great powers in the region. So Egypt in particular to begin with, um, and then in due course, Assyria and Babylonia. And the role that that Tyre and the other cities along Lebanon play is essentially that of um, sailors, uh, people who go out and source material, raw material, which they then turn into kind of high-end products, which they then um, sell on or pay as tribute to the Egyptians or to the Assyrians or whoever. And so to do this, they need to develop incredible you know maritime skills yeah um and they can do this partly because they have to but also because they have a lot of wood on the slopes of they have the cedars of lebanon the famous cedars of lebanon and so without that they would be um as denuded of timber as as egypt is or mesopotamia but because they have that and because they have no choice but to go out and earn their their keep on the waters they very very rapidly um become the kind of the, you know 
they they push the limits of navigation further than they've been pushed by anyone else. So, um, I mean, as early as the third millennium, the people of Byblos are developing ships with kind of curved hulls, whereas the Egyptians, for instance, had only had flat um, hulls. So basically never really mastered the art of venturing out into the Mediterranean. Yeah. But but the, but the, um, the the people of Lebanon are are, are really doing this, um, and it's this that enables them to survive the great catastrophe that overwhelms the um, the, the, the the really formidable Bronze Age powers in the the twelfth century, which is called the Bronze Age collapse, um, when essentially pe- mysterious people called the Sea Peoples, and at some point we might do an episode on them. Mm. They um, they they cross the seas. Egypt almost falls. All kinds of major powers do fall. One of them is a city called Ugarat, which is a neighbor of Tyre. That gets destroyed. Tyre survives. And there's a kind of breathing space then for the cities of Lebanon, particularly for Tyre, because both Egypt and the Mesopotamian empires are, are, you know, are pretty prostrate. And so the Tyrians can go out there. They, they have all this kind of naval expertise and um, they don't need to pay tribute. And so really, this is the kind of, you know, this is the kind of the golden age, really, of Tyre. So they're, they're going out, they're getting raw materials, they're coming back, they are taking to workshops, the raw materials are being processed, yeah. um, and they're then deliberately making it for foreign markets. So they're, 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 they're constructing things in Egyptian styles or Mesopotamian right. styles. So these people are craftsmen, traders, middlemen, yes. merchants, you know, they I guess your classic kind of Middle Eastern, you know, Levantine um, maritime power, aren't they? Yeah. They, they, um, uh, yes. I mean, and they're kind of, I suppose, serving a role slightly analogous to maybe Hong Kong did to uh, to China in the right in the twentieth century. Or Singapore it's, earlier. Yeah, or Singapore. That, yeah. It's 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 that kind of thing, that kind of role. Um, I mean, that's very anachronistic, I guess. Um, but it gives you some kind of flavour. Now, you may be wondering how we know about this. Um, archaeological evidence is very, very sparse because Tyre has been destroyed and built over so many times. Um, we do have um, king lists, which have been preserved by Josephus, the, the Judean writer in the first century AD. But I mean, you know, that's that's a thousand years on, so not yeah. entirely reliable. Um, but we do have sources for the ancient history of Tyre. Um, oh, and one of them is nothing less than the book we've already mentioned, which right. is the Bible. Oh, Tom, you love it. We love the Bible. So um, in the book of Kings, which describes the rise of the state, the the kingdom of Israel in its golden age. So David and Solomon. The king of Tyre, a man called Hiram, plays a a very key role. So David has captured Jerusalem. He is preparing the way to, to build his great temple. Um, he wants to build a palace, doesn't have the raw materials and the expertise that the, the people of Tyre have. And so they kind of strike a deal, basically, that um, David will allow Tyrian merchants access to the Red Sea. And in return, Hiram will give wood and material and craftsmen to David. And it's really in the reign of David's son, Solomon, that this starts to pack a massive punch because of course Solomon wants to build the temple and does so and he couldn't have done this so the bible tells us without the assistance of Hiram and what Hiram gets in return is um what a, a city perched on the edge of the sea always needs which is kind of you know the possibility to grow its own food so Solomon sells Hiram some cities that has you know excellent agriculture um so so it's a, it's both of them benefit and so the Bible goes into some detail about what this means in practical terms. So Solomon builds a, a Red Sea fleet, and uh, and I'll quote from from uh, from the Book of Kings. And Hiram sent him ships commanded by his own officers, men who knew the sea. These, with Solomon's men, sailed to Ophir and brought back four hundred and fifty talents of gold, which they delivered to King Solomon. Now, we have touched on these these expeditions already in one of our episodes, namely King Solomon's mines, because the location of Ophir is a great mystery. And of course, Ryder Haggard situates it in Africa. Yeah. Um, and, and we know that it's a real place because um, a fragment of pottery was found in 1946, um, I think kind of 8th century BC, sometime like that, which, which makes a reference to it. So it definitely existed. 
Um, probably not Africa, maybe Arabia or India or Sri Lanka. I mean, all of those have been proposed. We'll probably mm -hmm. never know. But it, it kind of gives a sense of... Um, you know the excitement of it, the uh, the 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 sense that there are a, a new worlds of possibility and wealth out there, and that the Tyrians want want a bit of it. I mean, yeah. more than a bit of it, they want a lot of it. And of course, Tyre has direct access to the Mediterranean, and the Bible tells us that um, they are also that Solomon and Hiram are also sending fleets across the Mediterranean, um, and they travel to a mysterious place called Tarshish, a great fleet. Um, and every three years, this fleet would return, and I quote the Bible again, carrying gold, silver, and ivory, and apes and baboons. And again, the location of Tarshish is uncertain. People have suggested it might be Sardinia, mm -hmm. or perhaps um, going beyond the Straits of Gibraltar, the Pillars of Hercules, um, a, a, a settlement um, founded by the Tyrians called Gardes, which will go on to become the Spanish city of Cadiz. Um, but more likely, it's a place called Tarshish, which is kind of approximates to Andalusia today, so southern Spain. Okay. Um, so, Tom, if the um, the Tyrians are having all this contact with the uh, the people of the Bible, um, are there kind of religious contacts and things, cultural contacts and things like that as well, like gods and rituals and all of that stuff that kind of feeds into into what becomes Judaism? Uh, yes, there, there there are congruities. Um, because the Israelites and the people of Canaan, as the people of Tyre would have probably have described themselves, um, you know, they're very close. Um, and it's precisely the fact that they are close that makes the, the writers of these stories, and, you know, these stories are being written many centuries later, anxious about the Tyrians. So there's definitely, you know, there's definitely admiration for, 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 for Tyre. You know, the, the Bible can't help but... The, you know, it's not just in the Book of Kings, but um, Isaiah and Ezekiel, they are stupefied by the wealth of Tyre. Um, you know, the the sense that that really treasure itself is in some way Tyrian. So um, Fergus Miller, uh, the great historian um, of, of of ancient history, so Fergus Miller, the great ancient historian, he pointed out that um, in Jerusalem, right up to the the, the final days of the temple. The standard currency that's being paid in the temple is Tyrian shekels. So, I mean, that's kind of massive witness to just how significant yeah. Tyre is as a kind of model of of of, of trade and wealth. But you're right that there, there there are also huge causes for anxiety. So, the name Moloch, which uh, Flaubert draws on for his novel, mm -hmm. this comes from the Bible. And we're told in the Bible that Solomon builds a temple to Moloch, who, who is described as the detestable god. And we're told also later on that uh, Moloch it has a sanctuary to him in a, a valley outside Jerusalem, and that this sanctuary is in a particular place called Tophet. And this Tophet is described as a place where men sacrifice, and I would quote the Bible, their sons and daughters to the fire of Moloch. Golly, like in Flaubert's book, son of exactly, like the Carthaginians. Ex exactly like in Flaubert's book. And we are told as well that two kings of Judah um, offer up their sons to Yahweh there, um, offering them up presumably in, in the fire before going to war, which absolutely is a kind of echo of the, the scene in Salambo. Um, and although this isn't explicitly associated with Tyre, there is also a sense after the kind of the glory days of Hiram and Solomon building the temple together that Tyre's reputation is darkening. And this, this darkening of the reputation is focused on a particular woman who is the daughter of um, a king of Tyre in the ninth century called Ithobal. Um, and this woman is Jezebel. Ah, now I wondered if we get to Jezebel. Now she's a great character, Tom. She's she given is. her name to, I mean, she's become a noun. She has. So a painted Jezebel. Um, so uh, a, a woman of ill repute, yeah. uh, a seductress, uh, someone who lures people off the straight and narrow. Um, intriguingly, Dominic, according to Josephus again, writing in the, the first century AD, uh, she was the great aunt of Dido. So it's a kind of brilliant crossover. Yeah, could um, happen. But according to the Bible, the, she the marries... The cinematic universe, Tom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so according to the Bible, she Jezebel marries Ahab, who is the king of Israel. And it's kind of one of the famous passages in the Bible that Ahab... Um, devotes himself to, uh, to to Baal, and he's opposed in this by the, the two great prophets, the Israelite prophets, Elijah and Elisha. 
Yeah. And of course, biblical writers hate this. They hate the idea that an Israelite king might have been seduced by the worship of Baal. Um, and so after Ahab's death, Elisha comes to an Israelite chariot officer called Jehu and anoints him as king. And Jehu gets in his chariot and uh, he drives furiously, the Bible says, and he kills Ahab's sons, who are respectively the king of Israel and the king of Judah. And then he goes to find Jezebel and Jezebel sees him coming and she uh, adorns her hair, paints herself, puts on her finest robes, looks down at Jehu from her window and condemns him as the murderer of his master. And Jehu looks up and sees her surrounded by her eunuchs and orders the eunuchs, throw her down. Yeah. And the eunuchs know, you know which side their bread is buttered on. And so they do throw her down. And the Bible then says that Jehu went in and ate and drank. Take care of that cursed woman, he said, and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. And so his servants go out to, to find Jezebel's body and bury it. But all they find is her skull, her feet, and her hands. All the rest of her has been eaten by dogs. Oh, and this is the on. fulfillment of a curse that had been delivered by Elijah that Jezebel would be eaten by dogs. It's a great story. I'll be, I'll be, I'll level with you. When I did do scripture at school, um, back in the mists of time, you were Team Jezebel, were you? I, I, I just thought that was a brilliant story. I think I wrote an essay on that story, maybe even an illustrated essay. I just think people being eaten by dogs is always good box office. Anyway. There, there, there are some great illustrations of it. Anyway, so, so. In the Bible, you get you know a, a mixture of admiration of Tyre and hostility to her. You also get the same in the writings of the other ancient people who bear witness to the glory of Tyre, which is the Greeks. So it's right. a bit like with Persia. We know basically the narratives we get about Persia come from the Greeks and um, biblical accounts. It's the same with the people of Tyre. And Tyre plays a very important role in Greek mythology because um, the princess Europa, which gives her name to the continent of Europe comes from Tyre. Um, so her, the Europa, um, she's a beautiful princess. She has a father usually called Agenor, but in some accounts called Phoenix. Um, and Europa is playing on the beach. A, a great white bull appears. Europa clambers onto the bull. The bull swims out to the sea and Europa vanishes. And this bull, it turns out, is Zeus. But, the, but Agenor, or Phoenix, whatever you want to call him, doesn't know this. And so he sends out his sons to go and find Europa. And the most famous of these sons is a guy called Cadmus, yeah. who ends up traveling to Greece. There he kills a dragon. Um, he's told by Athena to sow the teeth of the dragon. Uh, men grow from these teeth. Cadmus throws a stone in among them. They all start kind of crashing into each other, chopping each other up. Um, falling on each other's swords. Only five of the, these mysterious men survive, and they help Cadmus to found a very, very famous Greek city, namely Thebes. And the, the Acropolis of Thebes is called the Cadmea. And at the end of his life, uh, Cadmus and his queen are turned into serpents. Golly. So this all sounds, you know, uh, mad. Implausible, Tom. Implausible. Yeah. But in the opinion of the Greeks, th there's a sense in which the story of Europa and Cadmus is the absolute fountainhead of history because it is with Europa that Herodotus begins his history, the first work of history that we have, because he is trying to rationalize this myth. And he says that actually it wasn't Zeus who abducted Europa, it was Greek merchants, and they were doing it because Tyrian merchants had abducted a Greek princess. And so there's this kind of reciprocal um, princess rustling going on. Right. And this culminates in the sack of Troy and then in due course with the Persian invasion of Greece. Um, so, you know, that's bad, Tyre behaving badly, but there are also positives because um, Herodotus attributes to Cadmus a really major, major innovation without which he wouldn't be able to write his histories. And this is the invention of writing. So Herodotus says, the Greeks, in my opinion, had not possessed a, a, an alphabet up until that point. To begin with, the letters were the same as those Cadmus had used in Tyre, but in due course, as time went by and the language of the Greeks evolved, so too did the form of their script. So there's so, that sense that this is how right. Greek has evolved from the Tyrian script. And is that plausible? Well, we'll maybe come to that in the second half when we look at what these myths and stories might 
might actually tell us about the historical reality. So Herodotus also gives us quite a lot of other information about Tyre. He, he says that he's visited it in person. He says that he's, he's seen um, a, a fabulously ancient temple that according to the priests who minister there is 2,300 years old. So this is kind of a bit like the Egyptians. You know, the Tyrians and the Egyptians look at the Greeks as children. Um, Herodotus says that in this this temple, there are two pillars, one of pure gold and the other of emerald, which gleams very brightly in the dark. And Herodotus also confirms that um, Carthage was founded by Tyre. So it's from Herodotus that we get the story that the people of Tyre wouldn't sail against um, Carthage, even when commanded to by the Persian king. Um, and there's a sense in which, although the Tyrians... Um, you know, have are, are kind of committed not to fighting the Carthaginians. They're very keen about fighting the Greeks because in the great war that the um, the Persian king Xerxes launches against the Greeks, it's the Tyrians who provide a key naval contingent because they are still master mariners. Um, and uh, so there's a sense there again of a kind of rivalry between the Greeks and the people of Tyre and the other people. Because I should add at this point that that Tyre is not the only city to be um, uh, providing a squadron to the Persian king um, and fighting at the battles of Artemisian and Salamis. So Herodotus also names the uh, kings of two other city-states. So one of them is, is Sidon, uh, which we've already mentioned, the great port north of Tyre. Uh, another is a, 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 port, a, a port called Arados. Um, and these are all different cities, but according to Herodotus, they are a single people. Right. Um, so rather like, uh, say, Athens and Sparta and Thebes are all Greeks, Herodotus assumes that Tyre and Sidon and Byblos, that they are all a single people. And he names this people as Phoenicians. Mm, I wondered if we get to the Phoenicians. Right. So, so they're named after Phoenix. Right, who is the the brother of Cadmus? Have I got that right? Or it might be the other way round. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so Phoenix is. I mean, there are kind of various traditions. Phoenix might be the father of Cadmus. He might be the brother of Cadmus. It's confused because obviously he didn't really exist. And the likelihood okay, is, is that, yeah. that I've he's, that he he's didn't in, exist. He's invented to explain who the Phoenicians are. Yeah. Um, Herodotus is not the first Greek author to mention the existence of Phoenicians. So Homer does. So in the Iliad, the, the the funeral games that are held for Patroclus, the beloved of Achilles in the Iliad, um, the first prize in, in the foot race is a kind of beautiful silver mixing bowl that has been that has been made in Sidon and brought by Phoenician merchants. Um, and in the Odyssey, when Odysseus has returned to Ithaca and he's um he's met by Athena and he lies to Athena just because that's what Odysseus does. He always lies, even to Athena. And he, he claims that he's a fugitive from Crete um, and that he's paid passage to, um, to Phoenicians who have brought him to Ithaca. And Athena laughs because she knows that you know, Odysseus is always lying and she loves it. Um, so there's, so, so the, the Phoenicians are, they're kind of slightly shadowy figures in Homer, but Herodotus gives us a lot more detail. Um, so he tells us that originally they came from the Red Sea. Again, he confirms that they're amazing sailors. He, he talks a lot about their ventures westwards into the Mediterranean. But also he, he tells this famous story about how a pharaoh had employed Phoenician sailors to sail down the coast of uh, the Red Sea, keep going. And ultimately, they go all the way around Africa, come up through the Straits of Gibraltar and through the Mediterranean back home. And Herodotus himself says he doesn't believe this. But, um, but because you know, he gives details about where the sun is rising that demonstrates that the Phoenicians had gone beyond the line of the equator, it's clear that th actually this story is true. And Herodotus acknowledges that it's the Phoenicians who are the best sailors in Xerxes' fleet. Um, now, Greek attitudes to the Phoenicians harden in the wake of the Persian Wars because obviously the Phoenicians have played this key role in attempting to defeat the Greeks that gets right. defeated at Salamis. So the Greeks, the Greeks hold grudges, right? I mean, they, 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 they're yes. not going to let this go. They do. And so Thucydides, the great historian of the Peloponnesian War, he describes the, uh, the Phoenicians as barbarians. Um, he says how actually it was the Phoenicians who'd originally settled Sicily, but then they'd been forced out by Greek colonizers. And he thinks that this is absolutely tremendous. Um, and I think 
there's a sense there that the Phoenicians are, you know, unlike the Persians, are kind of sinister doppelgangers of the Greeks. That they are, that they're they're simultaneously alien and similar, and that's what makes them unsettling. And I think you get the same thing actually in the Bible, that that the biblical writers are alarmed by, let's call them the Phoenicians, because they are so recognizable. They are so similar. And that's why the hostility develops. Both because the, they're both big rivals, the, right? I mean, they're, yeah, they're, but, but, but they're also, commercial rivals, cultural rivals. Yes. But, but because they're so similar, that in a way accentuates the hostility. Um, so there's no question that the... Um, the Phoenicians are the rivals of the Greeks in this kind of early period, going from Homer, you know, up to, um, I suppose, the, the you know the time of the Persian Wars, and then Carthage inherits that mantle, and Carthage fights against um, the Greeks in Sicily, and then of course against Rome, and the Romans inherit the suspicion of of the Phoenicians and particularly the Carthaginians. So they they have this phrase um, Punica fides. So right. Punic faith. Uh, Punic is the derives from the Latin word for Phoenician, and it's the the Greeks and the Romans who major in the story about child sacrifice. So there are over thirty Greek and Roman writers who refer to it, and this 30. is where yeah. And so Flaubert gets the uh, the account of. I mean, he gets the idea for child sacrifice from the Greek writers, and he gets the idea specifically that they are being sacrificed to Moloch from the Bible. And he blends it to create that extraordinary passage that we opened the uh, right. the, the show with. So I think we should take a break at this point. And when we come back, we should um, see, well, you know, what are we to make of all this? <laughs> okay. So there's a lot going on there, Tom. There's a lot of different sources, lots of different traces. And the second half, um, let why don't you, we try to pull it all together and say, who were the Phoenicians and what was their influence? on Carthage and, and what's Carthage all about. So come back after the break and we'll find out. Very exciting. Welcome back to The Rest is History. We are talking about Carthage, the great rival of uh, ancient Rome. Uh, we started with Gustav Flaubert talking about child sacrifice and the kind of lurid, blood-soaked reputation of Carthage. And Tom, in the first half, you traced Carthage's origins back to Lebanon, to the city of Tyre, and to these people called the Phoenicians. Now, the Phoenicians are one of the great historical mysteries, aren't they? So my question to you very simply is, who are they? Well, I, I'm not sure they, um, they are, they, they've traditionally been a great mystery. I think most people have assumed that a people called the Phoenicians existed, and that that's a fairly unproblematic conceptualization. However, recently, um, Skepticism about the existence of a, a people called the Phoenicians has become um, kind of very academically fashionable. Right. Uh, and so the debate is typified by two books that have come out within what the past uh, six or seven years. So the first is a book called In Search of the Phoenicians by a brilliant ancient historian called Josephine Quinn. Yes. Um, at know, Oxford. But, yeah. Um, and uh, she goes in search of the Phoenicians and um, Spoiler alert, she doesn't find them. <laughs> she, she basically says that um, it, it's completely wrong to think of there having been a people called the Phoenicians, that this is something that um, the Greeks have projected onto them, that the people of Tyre thought of themselves as Tyrians, that the people of Sidon thought of themselves as Sidonians. They did not have a collective identity. And essentially, the evidence that she adduces for that is that, you know, the, 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 the great empires of the of the age in the near east that they they never treat um what we might call phoenicia as as a kind of single region as a single province um she says we have no good evidence for the ancient people that we call phoenicians identifying themselves as a single people or acting as a stable collective and she argues fascinatingly that um the identification of the phoenicians as a single people kind of reflected um kind of cultural assumptions of the 19th and 20th century, a kind of, you know, the way in which people in Europe were identifying themselves with their primordial ancestors, and that particularly Christian Christians in Lebanon wanted to do the same because it would distinguish them from kind of Muslim Arab identity. And they, um, they basically 
did they invent the Phoenicians? No, they didn't invent them because there's evidence. No, there's people saying they existed beforehand. Well, the Greeks are saying. Are, are yeah. saying I mean, it's only the Greeks and the Romans who refer to them as Phoenicians. Um, but I, so, so the question then is, well, okay, so, so so the you know the people of Tyre and Sidon didn't refer to themselves as as Phoenicians, but did they have a sense of themselves as belonging to a kind of collective in the way that the Athenians and Spartans, even as they were fighting with each other, would have recognised themselves as Greek? And there, there are absolutely academics who still stick up for that tradition. So um, an equally brilliant book by um, a scholar called Carolina Lopez Ries, which came out um, in 2021, so only three years ago, Phoenicians and the Making of the Mediterranean. I mean, she is very, very clearly nailing her colors to the mast with, with that title. She absolutely does think that the Phoenicians existed. Mm -hmm. um, she says flat out, a Greek or Roman could recognize a Phoenician by specific traits. Okay. Uh, and Such she says, as? well, so the gods, uh, the rituals, the temples, the language, um, the clothes that uh, they wore, you know, the Romans, Roman comedians are always making fun of it. Um, the kind of specializations, you know, the maritime stuff, the trade, all that kind of thing. Right. And so right. she says the only real problem is that we do not know for sure how our subjects refer to their collective cities and networks, but this is not enough to deny a group identity. And so I, th for what it's worth, you know, I'm, <laughs> I, I am not in any way a specialist in this, but I, would side with the idea that there was a kind of inchoate sense among the Tyrians and the Sidonians that they did have a kind of shared cultural identity. Right. Um, so but they wouldn't have called themselves no, the Phoenicians. No. So so um, Carolina lopez Rios argues that they did call themselves Canaanites, which has kind of been the traditional view. Okay. Um, and uh, I mean, and this is how the biblical writers frame them. So they do frame the people of Tyre as worshippers of Canaanite gods. Um, so, um, in, in the first book of the, in the first book of Chronicles, a guy called Canaan yeah, is Canaan. the father of right. Sidon. So, yeah. you know, Canaan gives his name to the land and he's the father of Sidon who then goes on to found the city. Um, so I, I think that it's not just the Greeks who are seeing the people of Tyre and Sidon as, you know, yeah, distinctive. I think, well. I think the Israelites are doing that as well. Um, uh, but, but because you know, it, Sidon and Tyre are both seen as providing good things, in, you know, cedar and craftsmen yeah. and things like that, and of dangerous things. Um, so in one of, the, one of the biblical accounts of the life of Jezebel, um, she's described as being a princess of Sidon, not of Tyre. So you have there a sense that she's interchangeable. So people from outside, perhaps it's like Wolverhampton and Birmingham, Tom. Yes. People from outside can't quite tell that, you know, they, they, they are foolishly can't tell the enormous difference between those two places. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, actually, I think the obvious comparison is with the Greeks. Okay, um, you know, there aren't actually that that many passages where where Greeks talk about there being a Hellenic uh, culture, yeah. um, and we don't really have any. Let's call it Phoenician literature. So even Josephine Quinn, when although she denies the existence of Phoenicians, she's always mm -hmm. using Phoenicians in inverted commas. So, so right. I think even even you know that is betraying the fact that there is a kind of common culture there. Yeah. So whether you want to call them Phoenicians or Phoenicians in inverted commas, I think there there probably is. Um so <laughs> I th I think that the sense that you get in both the Bible and in Greek accounts that the Phoenicians are formidable sailors and that they are spectacularly wealthy. I think that these probably would have been recognized by the Phoenicians themselves as giving them a kind of common identity. But, but it is sharpened in the Greek case because the Greeks, in a sense, are, you know, they are direct rivals. What we were saying before the break, yeah. that the Greeks recognize themselves in the Phoenicians. And that's why, you know, they, the, the rivalry between them is, I think, is so kind of intense because the Greeks know that they are following in the Phoenician wake. Uh, the, it's the Phoenicians who've given them the alphabet, which has enabled writing to flourish, which in turn facilitates trade. But when the Greeks start spreading westwards to set up their own trade network, they find that the Phoenicians have, you know, have, uh, have got there before them, that the Phoenicians have occupied all the kind of the, the, the best spots because it's the Phoenicians who basically establish the, fir you know, the Mediterranean as a kind of common sea that enable um, the silver and the iron ore of, of Spain and Italy to be brought to the Near East. 
right. and for Near Eastern fashions to be taken to Italy and to Sardinia and Spain. And when are we talking about here, Tom? Five, I mean, 500 BC, further back, 1000 oh, BC? Further back, further back. When? Um, kind of, uh, say, 900, 800, okay. um, 700. Right. Um, so well before kind of the golden yeah. age of Greece. Yes, absolutely. Um, and but, but, uh, and the Phoenicians have been able to do this because, um, you know, as they've been doing since the third century millennium, they are at the cutting edge of maritime innovation. So they are building faster ships. Um, they are coating the uh, the hulls with bitumen. So they're the first to do that to ensure that you know the water doesn't seep through. Um, and they their ships are so streamlined that basically they can travel up to thirty miles a day. Uh, you know that's in- incredibly quick, and also they can travel at night because they are the people who have developed the use of the pole star, so they ah. can use that. And the Greeks themselves call the pole star the Phoenike, so they are branding the pole star as Phoenician, yeah. um, and it's this that enables has enabled the the the, the Phoenicians to plant colonies right the way across um, southern Africa, including Carthage supposedly in, in 814 BC, but mm-hmm. going onwards, uh, Sardinia, Sicily, uh, southern Spain, and out into the Atlantic. So we mentioned Gardez. And there are some stories, aren't there, Tom? There are sort of exaggerated myths and stuff that they went as far as um, Cornwall, or indeed North America, I, which I imagine is... we People think now is obviously... Right, is total okay. Tosh. Well, um, so... The Phoenicians are always looking for raw materials. They're looking for gold, for silver, for copper, for iron, and of course for tin. And to to get this, they they are going beyond the pillars of Hercules. Um, they are definitely planting colonies in uh, you know Atlantic Iberia and Atlantic North Africa. What so Portugal or what's now Morocco, basically? Yeah. yeah. But wh- whether they whether they go as far as Cornwall, I mean, this is a a, a tradition that's obviously very popular with the Cornish. Um, you <laughs> yeah. can, um, I mean, it's there's no archaeological evidence for it. There's no explicit right. written evidence for it. Um, but there is, I mean, this kind of classic ancient history. There is there is a poem that is written in late antiquity that is drawing on a fifth century poem. Well, a thousand years later. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, I'll, which, I'll, I'll, which, which? Sorry, Tom. I don't. I, I need a bit more than that. <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 I know you do. Um, and yeah. this, this mentions a guy called Himilco, who sails out into the Atlantic, and he brings tin back from a place called the the Cassiterides, which might be Cornwall, but equally, you know, it could be. Yeah, Northern Iberia or whatever. Yeah. I mean, we don't. It could Porto. be, yeah. um, but also um, we're told in this poem that Himilco had sailed out into the Atlantic Ocean and had found there that the, the the sea was covered with thick seaweed, and so it has been posited that perhaps this was the Sagasso Sea. Um, of of course, people have wanted to believe that they might have sailed all the way to America, and there have been kind of various faked, you know, lumps of stone with Phoenician writing inscribed in it but the, the, these are all fakes there's no Tom, hard evidence you've lost all our all. listeners in know, among the lebanese yeah, american community with this skepticism um the, but there is also um evidence that from a from a um a, a, a greek text called the Periplus, so the sailing round that um that a guy called hanno might have sailed very very far south down the coast of um africa mm. sourcing kind of ivory sourcing those those apes perhaps that um uh, is uh, were referenced in the bible um and uh, we know that he he sees um creatures that almost certainly were were chimpanzees so there's definitely a sense right. i think that you know the phoenicians are, are are really really formidable sailors and and tom let's get to carthage yeah so um they're going around they're, they're establishing these colonies probably not in cornwall but at least on the shores of the mediterranean and obviously the most famous the one that we began with is the great city of carthage so we reckon that happened i mean the traditional date for that is 814 bc is that plausible i think it's highly plausible i mean it's a lot more plausible than the date that virgil gives it which is of course around the time of the trojan war that is not when carthage is founded but yes so probably mid to late 9th century BC, okay. around when the traditional date is. I mean, it seems in, entirely plausible. Um, and it's one of a number of colonies that are being planted by 
uh, the Tyrians at this time. So there's also um, Utica, which is where Cato the Younger in due course will commit suicide. But Utica in, in Phoenician, that's the old city. Um, and uh, Carthage is the new city. That's what it means. So, um, you know, you have a, a, a sense there that Carthage is perhaps not even the oldest colony being planted by the Tyrians. Yeah. Um, but as I say, by around 700 BC, you have Phoenician cities, Phoenician trading posts everywhere from the Atlantic to the Levant. And as I said, nothing like it has been seen in the Mediterranean before. So the Phoenicians, or if you want to, in Phoenicians in inverted commas, I mean, these are really, really significant players in the development of trade and in the development of the, the Mediterranean, the sense of the Mediterranean as a kind of single sea. And evidence for the success of the Phoenicians in kind of cornering Mediterranean trade, I think is found in their very name. So this word Phoenix, which the Greeks say comes from, you know, this this Lebanese king called Phoenix, actually it it means um, perhaps palm tree. Yeah. So in the late fifth century, Carthage starts minting coins with a palm tree on it as a way of kind of advertising herself to the Greek world that she has a Phoenician identity. But it's likelier that it comes from the Greek word for kind of reddish purple. The reddish purple, the color of, re of, of purple, let's call it purple, comes from a, the, probably the most famous of all the Phoenician luxury products, um, which is a dye, which is made from mucus secreted by a, a, a distinctive kind of predatory mollusk called the <laughs> murex. Um, and these, these mollusks are found in the Eastern Mediterranean. And they're also found on the Atlantic coast of Morocco. And the mucus is secreted, I gather, specifically from the hypobranchial glands. And you can either do it by um, kind of tickling the mollusks and yeah. uh, secreting the, 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 the mucus that way, or you can just crush their skulls and yeah. pull the kind of the flesh out. And when you've pulled the flesh out, you uh, leave it to dry in the sun, uh, and then you add salt water depending on how rich you want the, the color of the dye to be. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, it absolutely stinks. So this is why the, um, the, uh, the, the dye factories are always on the edge of towns. Yes. So in Sidon, they found one, a, a, a pile of shells that's over kind of 130 meters high. So a, a lot of mollusks are being killed yeah. in the cause of making this dye. And it's a very specialized process. So even to this day, it's not really fully understood. Um, and this is um, the origin of Tyrian purple, which is an expression yeah. we still use. Yeah, it, yes, it is, and it's it's the association of of purple with spectacular wealth is evident in the fact that famously it becomes the colour that is associated with Roman emperors. So you can see why naming the Phoenicians after this luxury product, um, you know, it's in a way it's a kind of you know a grudging acknowledgement. <laughs> <laughs> of, of just how completely they've cornered high-end trade. So that's one story that's told about the, the Phoenicians by the Greeks. The other is this legend about um, Cadmus introducing the alphabet to Greece, which you asked about. Yeah. And the, and, and the consensus of scholars is that Herodotus is right. Hooray. Ah, oh, brilliant. You well know, done, Herodotus. Yet again, Herodotus gets it right. So the Phoenicians absolutely are the, the first to develop um, an alphabet in the sense of a kind of... Um, a, a, a standardized set of letters representing a range of sounds. And I, I'm absolutely not a linguist, and I know that linguists are famous for the tolerance with which they listen to long non-linguists describing different styles of, of, of writing and, uh, and um, script. But basically, the, the reason why the Phoenician alphabet is so significant is that it's kind of in contrast to what had gone before, which is scripts that use symbols to represent either syllables or specific words. And obviously, is is much harder for that reason to learn. If you say so the Phoenician letter ha alphabet has 22 letters, I mean, that is much easier to learn. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's derived from um, Egyptian hieroglyphs. So the kind of the prototype has been discovered. Some inscriptions were found in the early 20th century in, in Sinai. But it's the Phoenician alphabet that is the first alphabet in the sense that, that we who use it, to, you know, the Latin alphabet today would It's not hieroglyphs. It. So it's an alphabet rather than a hieroglyphic. Yeah, you know, exactly. So, the, the, so the, the, the symbols stand for letters rather than for things. Yeah, syllables so or, or things, or yes. objects. Yes, exactly. And it, 
you know, as Herodotus says, it influences the um, well, it kind of underpins the Greek alphabet. The Greek alphabet would be an impossible without the Phoenician example. The Greek Greek alphabet, in turn, um, influences the Latin alphabet that we use, um, the Cyrillic. Uh, you know, all, all, all kinds of of, of um, alphabets in the West, but it also influences alphabets in the East. So um, the Phoenician alphabet influences the Aramaic script which is adopted by the Persians for their use. And in the long run, it influences both Hebrew and Arabic. Mm. So the Phoenician script is unbelievably influential. Yeah. And although initially it's used for trade, famously, it also comes to be used for literature. We don't have any Phoenician literature, but of course we do have the first great epics written in Greek, those of Homer, which would be unthinkable without the Phoenicians. So we have nothing, literally nothing, written by the Phoenicians. Is that right? We have inscriptions. We have that kind of stuff. Tell we me don't, you love an inscription. I'm a little do, bit well, less tolerant uh, yeah. of inscriptions than you but, are. But, uh, you know, and the word, as we said, the word Biblos gives us the Bible. Greek word for book. So we know um, that they had book. Well, well I mean, papyruses yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they absolutely did. And it seems likely that it's via the Phoenicians that um, Near Eastern myth, so Gilgamesh and that kind of thing, enters Greek enters Greece. Mm. So this is how, you know, the, a lot of Greek mythology clearly owes a lot to, say, Mesopotam Mesopotamian mythology. And it seems to be the Phoenicians with their writing that kind of serve as the vectors. So, so that's that's one chalked up for for the Phoenicians. So we've got the, we've got the two actually. We've got the the die and we've got the the alphabet. But Dominic, what about the child sacrifice? Well, so this is waiting. what we've I've been began waiting an episode with. for this time. Um, tell me. So did they? So what would be your sense? Kids? Well, I know nothing about this, but I would say I'd like to believe they did it. Um, <laughs> I think it makes a better episode if they did it. I think uh, we want to end on a high. We want to end on a, well, on, a, on, a, on a note that people will remember. We don't want to just be debunkers all the time, Tom. Right. Well, I, I'm delighted you, you're going to be pleased because I would say that up until, say, the 90s, probably, yeah. the consensus among scholars was that it was all uh, you know, Greek, Greco-Roman propaganda. The Greeks and the Romans were othering the Phoenicians. Of course. They were, they were orientalizing them. They were orientalizing them. Shocking scenes. But I think, I think now the consensus would be that they absolutely did uh, kill, uh, the, certainly the Carthaginians did, did, did engage in child sacrifice. Uh, and the reason for that is that more and more sanctuaries have been found, which seem to point to, to exactly that. Um, so actually, you know, these have been known about for about 100 years now. So mm -hmm. um, these are, are, are open air enclosures marked out by stones, um, full of urns, some of which contain the, 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 the burned remains of livestock, mostly sheep, but some of which contain the um, burned remains of small children. And so unsurprisingly, these have been named Tophets after, after, the, place the, in the, after yeah. the place in the Bible. Yeah. Um, and the first one was found... Uh, uh, at a place called Moccia, which was an island off Sicily, very, very significant um, Phoenician city. And then in 1921, so this was two years after the one on Moccia, an enormous one was actually found in Carthage itself. So you see not everything in Carthage was destroyed. I mean, right. it was huge. So it was about 30,000 square meters, about 20,000 funerary urns. You know, these were being put there over the course of many, many years. And if if there seems to be a kind of biblical link in the you know in the, in in Tophet, the use of Tophet, we don't know what the Carthaginians called it, but yeah. you know the Bible provides a convenient a convenient name. Um, there are also lots of inscriptions in these Tophets um, explicitly stating that the children have been given as an offering, and the word that that is you the Phoenician word for this offering is a mulk. Oh, like Moloch! Like How exciting! Moloch. Yeah, like Moloch, and so it's likely that Moloch was not a god at all, but a, a kind of sacrifice, an offering of of a child. Um, so that is something I think that Flaubert does get wrong. That the god that children are being offered to is not um, is not Moloch, but a, another god. And in Carthage, it's a, a god called um, Baal Hamon. And his his um, his queen uh, called Tanit, and um, Baal means lord, and Hamon. Um, it seems to come from the Venetian word hamum, hum. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. What was that again? Hum, hum, hum. Okay. Um, you know, no no, uh, no no vowels. Right. Um, and this means 
display my expertise in Phoenician. Yeah, go for um, it. I've been consulting the Bodleian. Um, this means hot or, you know, a, a blaze, um, a fire. So, he's so you might call Baal. That's his name. Well, well another way, another way might be he he might. Well, no, not hot Baal, Lord of the Furnace. Oh right, that's I like hot Baal better. I think <laughs> I think you'll get more uh, you get more clicks with hot Baal. You're going to call Lord yourself of Lord fur- of the Furnace. Lord of the Furnace is pretty chilling. And Tanit. So Salonbo, I think, is the Tanit is in Salonbo in the novel, isn't? Yeah. It? Isn't yes, she, she is. a priestess of Tanit, the god god of yes. the goddess of the moon, something yes. like that? Yes. Yeah. So Tanit is is Tanit and Balhamon are equally the two great gods of right. Carthage, and Joseph Queen, Josephine Quinn in her book In Search of the Phoenicians has a brilliantly fascinating chapter on the Tophets, in which she points out that although there are lots of um, Phoenician settlements across the West that do practice this child sacrifice, there are also lots that don't. So it's you know, it's it's not something that is a marker of inverted commas, as she would put it, Phoenician identity, um, and it's definitely died out in in Phoenicia itself by mm-hmm. at the latest the seventh century, and so therefore she she argues the relative scarcity of this cult means that the users of the Tophets must have formed a self conscious group. This was a rare and highly distinctive ritual choice, and her thesis is that Carthage was actually not an official colony of Tyre but may have been founded by settlers who were fleeing um, you know, mainstream disapproval of their oh enthusiasm God, for child sacrifice. So it really is the United States to uh, tie right. Great Britain. Well, so, so she makes this explicit. She says, like the exodus of the Puritans to the New World, the yeah. formation of the Circle of the Tophet could have been a reaction both to new opportunities in the West and new religious restrictions in the East. A sinister and freakish offshoot. <laughs> Of the motherland, yeah, I mean, it's wow. amazing theory, isn't it? It's yeah, kind of love fascinating. It. And she points out also that the story of Dido, that you know, that it involves betrayal and deception and flight, that it's not a story of a, you know, a, a, a colonists being sent out with the, the the blessing of the mother city, yeah. and that perhaps this is a distorted echo of the reality that it was, it was kind of. Uh, religious exiles so tom actually we've come full circle in the episode because we started with that incredibly lurid and violent scene from flaubert's book salambo which has absolutely scandalized people in the 1860s understandably and actually we've come back to the idea that for all the stuff about orientalizing and othering quite possibly carthage was set up by a kind of child sacrifice cult (laughs) um, on the shores of the mediterranean and of course would evolve into the great rival to rome yeah, so, well, and, and, and that possibly it's not just the Greeks and the Romans who are looking at this with horror, that m- many of, inverted comma, Phoenicians would have done yeah. as well. Um, the old country. But, Crikey. of course, I mean, that, but that just emphasizes the importance of, of trying to see the world not through um, Greek or Roman or non-child sacrificing Phoenician eyes, right? but through the eyes of, of the Carthaginians themselves. And, and that, maybe, yeah, could we do that next time? Can that we get is, into the 